record. We're recording. Okay, I think we're started. Well, welcome everybody. I am Jen Worland. I've been sending you all the reminders and Zoom links for these starting a specialty food business in Idaho webinars. This will be our third one in the series. And we're really excited that you could join us today. Um, our topic today is um, really uh, important. Um, if you are going to be selling uh, through wholesale outlets um, and outside of the cottage food industry, and there are definitely regulations and we'll be going over that um, a little bit later. Um, I, am, I, I introduced myself in our first webinar but I'm an extension educator located in Teton County. Our office is in Driggs and I have a focus on community food systems. And uh, this has been something that uh, I've been doing these classes now. This will be my third round. This is the first time I'll be doing it all on, uh, in a webinar online format. We were doing these classes for a couple years um, in su with support um, from the Teton Valley Kitchen, which, is, which was a kitchen incubator site located in Triggs. That kitchen has since closed, but there's definitely been a need for education around um, food entrepreneurship. So today's webinar is our third in the series on labeling and ingredient analysis. And today's presenters are myself. Um, I'm an educator in community food systems and Julie Buck, who is with us. Um, she's an educator in family and consumer sciences and she's located in Bingham County. And then we also have a guest speaker who is a business owner, um, Juan Morales, and he'll be joining us later and talk about his business. So thank you so much. So before we get started, here's a few webinar tips so that everything runs smoothly. Please close all your other programs on your computer. That will also help um, save bandwidth and make sure that things aren't getting interrupted. If you're having issues with sound, you can mute yourself on your computer and there is a call in number provided in that welcome email. I sent, uh, you should have gotten an email confirmation when you registered for the series, but also I sent a reminder yesterday. So feel free to mute your computer sound. Sometimes you get better audio joining in via your phone. If you do have any questions, please use that chat box and um, I'll be helping to monitor that and um, it's a great place to ask questions. Also feel free to email me. Um, you have my email with the confirmation emails, happy to help you and if I, you know, in whatever capacity I can. We will have some handouts. Um, we have been sending those to the people registered for the workshop. Uh, if you registered later after September 29th, um, and you're not sure if you've gotten all of the handouts, feel free to also email me and I can forward you those emails. So today's webinar topics include going over food safety basics. We had a really great presentation last week um, with a health inspector that really kind of dove into the intricacies of having um, a safe food uh, business. Uh, We'll be briefly going over that and how it relates to ingredient sourcing, nutritional analysis and labeling. So I am just going to talk real briefly um, at the beginning of our presentation today, to just talk a bit about um, using locally produced foods. And it looks like a skipping video feed. Hmm, I don't know. And is anybody else having issues with the audio? Okay. It could be um, just the bandwidth issue. So I, I am, it looks like on my end, everything is going well, but it, really quick, I'm gonna go over some benefits and considerations when producing locally or when using locally produced goods in your products. So the reason I'm showing this slide on a community food system is that food producers play a vital role in our food system. So um, not just the farmers and the ranchers that are starting with the, with the food, but going through our, our community food system, you do play a vital role in the sustainability of our food system. 
So a quick note about local food system. There's not really an agreed upon definition of local food, but most people refer to local food as a geographic characteristic. And so by purchasing local products, you can greatly affect the sustainability of your community. And local products are also a growing consumer are growing in consumer popularity and they can increase the value of your product. So one way to help understand this complexity and to identify gaps in our food system is to use a system seeking approach. And that's what's illustrated in this graphic on your screen. And this helps us examine the linkages and interactions between the various components of the food system. So everything from production um, down to processing, distribution, all the way through into consumption and then even um, re waste recover recovery and nutrient cycling. So a community food system um, is, it, it's like the word sustainable and that it can be an incredibly broad and yet inclusive process and it can mean different things to different people. But I've derived this definition on our screen from the University of California's Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. And similar variations of this definition are frequently cited in literature. So real quick, some benefits of sourcing locally produced goods are that there's a huge demand now. Um, Juan might mention this. Uh, he does always like write, you know, made in Teton Valley on his products. And it does really help um, add value and, and help him get into this niche market. It can, having locally produced food also can really help with the freshness of your product. So typically grocery store produce travels on average about 1500 miles before consumption. And so you're reducing that. You can also have much greater nutrition. So fresher fruit food has more nutrients and purchasing these ingredients directly from small scale farmers and processors can help with food safety because it can build confidence in the product. And if there's a foodborne illness outbreak, it's often easier to track where the infected food comes from. So there's less steps or supply chains between you and the food source. And it's also likely that less people will be infected. So since the food's fresher, there's less time for spoilage and potential growth of the pathogen. Other benefits are that, um, that it can also lower your carbon emissions due to less travel requirements. But one thing to, to keep in mind that you do have to continue to have safe handling, packaging, distribution, and storage. Those are paramount. And you can perhaps have two times the amount of money stay in your local community when you're purchasing local versus from a large distributor. And the currency is distributed more frequently in our local food system. So on the right side of this slide shows some marketing branding, some logos about like locally produced or made in Teton Valley. These are great ways to get your product noticed. And some main considerations to have when purchasing local food is it, it is definitely different than purchasing through wholesale or a distributor. So um, think about how you're going to purchase that food and um, do your homework ahead of time. And know that the demand for local food can be greater than the supply. So um, be aware of that and know the seasonality of foods and know that there's, um, know your local community and what is grown in your area. So other considerations are that you should know your purchasing power and do you have the proper storage for the, for the products? Is the, how perishable is the item? Uh, how can you design your product to optimize local food purchasing? And visit your farmer's markets. Go learn from the farmers and the ranchers that are selling at your market. Establish relationships with the growers and talk to them ahead of time. So just like you know that the farmers are incredibly busy um, and you'll, you'll need to work with them. So talk to them ahead of time. Talk to them in the winter to plan for certain crops in the summer. And if the farmers don't know that there's a market for the product, they might start to grow it if you've had that conversation. Other things are um, know your terms and you can just do some searching um, other terms that might be uh, that you could look up are natural or grass fed or organic. 
um, and, and just really have fun building that relationship and, and tell, use the local food to help tell your own story with your products. So real briefly, um, when purchasing local food, you still definitely need to pay attention to food safety. And we'll be talking about that later in the webinar. But most farmers have on-farm food safety plans and they voluntarily participate in GAP, which is an acronym for good agriculture practices. <clears throat> and they participate in those um, GAP audits. These GAP certifications can be done by a third party, such as the USDA or Primus or Global uh, GAP. And it involves the successful completion of an on-farm audit. Trainings are done online or in person. And Julie Buck will later talk about food safety considerations such as FISMA and GAP. I know that local food can have tremendous economic, social, and environmental benefits that can help add value to your product. So with telling your story and promoting your product, cite your sources and people like to know where your food comes from. They like to have that personal relationship. Use that in your advertising. Tell your story and reap the many benefits of purchasing local. So I'm going to end my slides for now and Julie's going to share her screen. And whenever you're ready, it should be okay. All right, thank you, Jen. I'm just pulling this up and <clears throat> just had to change a few slides really quick. So we'll just get started here. <clears throat> so as Jen mentioned, uh, this, is, this is what I'm gonna talk to you about today. And I really appreciate uh, her leading us out with the basic uh, premise of how someone gets to the point of uh, locally sourcing their uh, cottage food industry that they're interested in. I think that's so vital. So uh, I'm just gonna go over a few definitions. So we all are on the same page with uh, what, whatever background we're coming from and uh, just focus on uh, how to start with a plan for getting your business up off the ground and all those certification and test options that are available to you. I've got some links for those. And also uh, what, I, what I think you really wanna hear about are, is the nutritional analysis and uh, possibilities and uh, labeling, what that's gonna look like as well. So when we get into definitions for uh, what a cottage food industry is, I just I've just kind of brought it down into a nutshell here, but I I do have some active links here. I'd, I'd like to take you to those and see if these will pull up okay for us. So, uh, what is what are those foods that are part of the cottage food industry? And um, let's go to this one instead. Uh, no, that's not it. It's sorry. Let me go back. And we still see your slide. That's what we're seeing right now. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, the cottage food, uh, and I can definitely send these forms to Jen to share with you, but uh, a cottage food is definitely defined and it, it has to be something that does not need a uh, time and temperature control to make sure it's safe. So that has got the acronym of non-TCS. So a non-TCS food would be those that are pretty shelf stable 
And so we're looking at baked goods that don't require refrigeration, fruit, jams, and jellies, honey, fruit pies, breads, cakes that do not require refrigeration, such as pudding cakes or sponge cakes or custard cakes. Uh, same things with pastries and cookies, candies and confections that also do not require refrigeration. So fudge, you know, can definitely be okay at a, at a, at a uh, room temperature or stable. Uh, dried fruit, fruits, um, but they have to have a pH uh, below 4.6. And so this is where you're going to have to get into some analysis and have a conversation with your local um, health department who can walk you through the application, which definitely um, I'm gonna share with you as well. So uh, they can help you assess the water content of your food. It needs to um, have a water activity level below 0.85. So that's, that's you know, about where bread is. So it's a pretty dry product. So that's very important. And that's sort of the things that are going to control for pathogens because foodborne pathogens just love, uh, they love moisture and they love heat. So, and they love uh, lowest, they, they love uh, a certain level of acidity. Um, so those are things that are need to be controlled and that's where the guidance is gonna come in. So uh, it's one thing to have an idea, but it's another thing to get it through the process of approval and make sure that you're on track with all of that. So uh, dried herbs are great, seasonings and mixtures, cereals, those are all very dry. Trail mixes and granola, you'll see those quite a bit at, uh, at cottage food, uh, at, at sales of cottage foods. Vinegar is a great one because it's high acid. So that would be a product that would be okay. Popcorn, popcorn balls uh, can be made safe. And then, and then I've seen a lot of tinctures, which are herbs that are put into a alcohol base or another glycerin base or uh, another fluid base, as long as it doesn't make a medicinal claim, then it's, it's okay to go with that. So there's, there's, a, there's some definitions that you'd need to be made aware of. And these resources are available at the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. There's, um, these are all available online to you and I would encourage you to make sure that your product is safe. The, there's a, you can definitely fill out a form to get your food assessed. So they are just gonna ask you some basic information and then you'll, they'll give you a, a rating. You can actually see what it is at the bottom of the form you fill out and they will help you to know if your product is going to be able to be sold as a cottage food item. And um, they can lead you along this process. They're there to help you for sure. So I, I'd really encourage you to start with a plan. And uh, Idaho Health, Health and Welfare has a food protection uh, plan. I want to encourage you to structure your business and your products so that it just seamlessly complies and you know from the start that there's products that will work there's products that won't work and i can work within the system that is in the state of idaho and it's all there for the safety of our consumers who are purchasing our products and ourselves as as producers uh, let me know if this shows up. I'm going to see if this link uh, shows up. Are you seeing a different screen now besides my PowerPoint? No, I just see the PowerPoint. So you might need to go down to the bottom where it shares share screen, and then you should be able to see which screen you can, like it gives you a choice of what windows to show. Okay. I'm going to flip over to here. Uh, try it this way. Now, can you see the University of Idaho's website? Yes, it's great. Perfect. Okay. Uh, there's this wonderful resource and Jen and I and some others on the call are employed by University of Idaho, but 
there's this uh, everything you need to know and a lot of help here uh, on this website. So I'm hoping that you can capture this and I can also put it in the chat as well, but um, there's just a lot of information here. So uh, you can uh, get some training here. You can learn about, uh, uh, for instance, here's how to develop your food safety plan. Uh, this, this program is, uh, you know, where you can get the free food safety gap assessment for your operation. Uh, you can get some free training and templates needed to create your FISMA compliant food safety plan. Um, it's, this, is, this is all free to you in the state of Idaho. So uh, I'd really encourage you uh, to take a look at this. Here's the, the workshops that are available to get a deeper dive into what we're doing right now. Uh, we've got uh, just a lot of information here. I'm not gonna take uh, a lot of time here. I just want you to be aware that there is training available and it's grant funded. So I would definitely take, um, take advantage of this opportunity for you. Let's see it. Oh, thank you, Jen. I appreciate you doing that. Just so that we at least have a little bit of food safety basics, I know that you covered that with your the health department presenter last week, but I also want to just tell you that the very, very basics are to start with proper hand washing and it's still a 20 second hand wash with warm water, soap of any kind, and uh, hopefully a paper towel to dispose of after you've done a 20 second hand wash. This is vigorous, it's making bubbles on your hand, you're getting between your fingers, up around your wrists, and that is before we put our gloves on. So I would, you know, restrain your hair, restrain your, you know, cover your beard if you have any facial hair. Uh, a restraint of hair can be uh, and a cap on your head, it can, like a baseball cap, it can be uh, a regular net that goes over, and this is all to prevent those unfortunate occurrences. And we've all had them happen when we find something that is not supposed to be in our food from the person who prepared it. So uh, make sure that you take those precautions and change your gloves every four hours during preparation or change before tasks or change when tasks change. You know, change when you go to the restroom, touch your hair, you know, the, that glove's gonna be, um, contaminated at that point, you're going to have to start over. And I know it seems tedious, but we're talking about preventing foodborne pathogens. And that is that is something that you don't ever want to have happen to you. Uh, it's, it's absolutely terrible. Many of us have had foodborne illnesses and, and we don't want to get our business shut down or our professional credentials threatened because we've had a, an experience or a, an event where food safety hasn't been practiced properly. So there is a fight back and that stands for fight bacteria, but uh, fightback.org has some great resources, handouts, information. Uh, basically, we're still learning how to clean, separate, cook and chill. So when you look at your kitchen and we, I have two in my office here, uh, you know, I'm gonna think about how I bring food into that kitchen, how my counters are clean before the food comes in, my hands are clean when I'm putting it away. And then I'm going to separate my produce from my raw meats, keep them separate in the fridge, uh, you know, cook to proper temperatures, which uh, haven't changed either. So make sure you own a meat thermometer, digital or read dial would, are great. Have a refrigerator thermometer in your fridge. And then if uh, it's make sure you cool it uh, and chill it properly within two hours after uh, preparation and make sure you know and date the leftovers in your fridge. You know, you could practice at home. And then if you have a separate fridge for your commercial purposes, you can uh, keep a log on the outside of the door um, um, of temperature checks. And those are the type of things that we're, you're not an ex inspected facility, but those are the type of things I used to inspect in facilities. So the very important checks and balances to make. Um, FIFO, let's just see if you're paying attention. Can anybody type in the chat what FIFO stands for? It's an acronym. Yep, 
Yes, Shaylin, thank you. First in, first out. So what that means is I'm gonna keep track in my fridge and I do this at home, you know, which cheese went in first, that should be the first one out. And so right now I've got two packages of shredded cheese and uh, regardless of what the date is stamped on there, I should keep track of which one went in first and which one needs to come out last. First in, first out. So you can rotate, you can practice this at home with your dry goods, what's in your pantry and uh, definitely what's going on in your freezer. Most um, foods in the freezer should be there six months or less unless it's a deep freeze and it's uh, a protein food that can stay in for up to a year. So, you know, really get yourself into the habit of, of having first in first out in your own personal kitchens. And then with your cottage food industries, you'll be much more seamless at it. it it'll just flow. It won't be a problem for you. So we do this at our a pantry here at the office. When foods start to get outdated, we either use them up or we, we send them home with people to use up or we throw them out. All right. Let's talk about certifications and tests that are available for you. There are uh, quite a few of them and it really depends uh, how deep you're diving into this cottage food industry. The, uh, there's lots of options. I took these straight off of this certification test website and I'll take you there in just a minute. But um, it, you know, you, a lot of these won't be required because you're not inspected. I'd highly recommend that you have a certification. They're eye-opening. You just learn not only what to do, but why. You learn the why behind all of these steps and, and what we're doing in our kitchens and should be doing with the cottage food industries we're part of. So there's lots and lots of options here. Uh, I've got um, you know, it's, it's kind of higher end at the top versus just more, uh, food manager level exam from serve safe. Uh, let me take you to this website. Oh, thank you, John. That will work as well. So, um, I won't take you to the website cause there it is in the, in the chat, but, um, we also have one at university of Idaho. It's called ready, set food safe. If, people aren't requiring you to take um, any of these, which do cost money, uh, you can take the Ready, Set, Food Safe for free. So I don't know if you can find that link or not, Jen, but that would be a good one to include as well. A lot of people want to understand about nutritional analysis. So, um, I don't know that I have a package in my office of any food right now, but if you're near to something that's got a food label on it, uh, just go ahead and take a, take a grab it and look at it right now. And really why we have nutritional analysis is because we really want to know what nutrients I'm providing to my consumers or to myself. So when I go purchase food in the grocery store, I'll take those nutrition analysis uh, portions of the label side by side so I can get an idea, uh, the food label, or if it's got an analysis on it. Uh, this goes a little deeper dive than the food label though. So um, what I would suggest is, I would just suggest just to humor yourself, go take a look at these professional uh, websites. And I'm going to take you to them right now so you can see how these are broken down and how high you can go, how low and how high you can go with the depth of the analysis that goes into your product. So, you know, caramel popcorn, do I really need to know the nutritional analysis? I know that it's a grain. I know that it's got a lot of sugar in it, but, you know, as compared to nutritional analysis, if I'm having some type of a uh, a more nutritional product, so to speak, 
you know, it might be worth you taking a look at. Uh, for certain, you're going to want a label, but I think nutritional analysis for cottage food industries is, is a little probably more a bigger step than what most would take. Uh, but consumers are really wanting to know. They're very savvy now and they're very into, hmm, you know, why would I want to buy this home based business product compared to uh, this? you know, commercial product. Why would I want to do that? And if you have the analysis, then then that's a possibility. So I'm going to take you to um, these websites just to take a little look, see about those. All right, this is Nutra data, and this is a nutrient analysis between the prices of 250 and 750. So you can kind of see, it just goes from a big span of what, what you would want, why you would want to go higher. Um, there are lots of packages. If you wanted to get a nutritional analysis, this is an extremely reputable company. Uh, Nutridata, I've used this as a clinical dietitian, as a private dietitian. Uh, I'll have persons give me their menus and I'll, I'll use Nutridata or a program like it so that I can analyze their food intake. So you can do it as per product and uh, there's just lots and lots of options. It's a laboratory analysis, so you're, you, it's very reputable. Uh, and then also, um, what about if it has allergens? You know, if you really can't make a claim unless, you know, you know for sure that it's allergen free. So that's that's a very important analysis as well, that it has an ingredient statement and allergen declaration would be $295. So really on the lifetime of your product, that's not a big expenditure compared to the equipment that's in your kitchen to produce the product. So uh, it's something to consider. I just want you to feel like you have you have all the options in the world to you and that you can find what best fits your needs. Uh, I also want to take you to uh, the other one. Let's see if I can pull that up. There's also this food testing lab that's uh, another option that's very reputable. I just wanted you to see the difference in pricing. So let me share that with you. Do you know which one people use most commonly or what they use the most in Idaho? Uh, I do I do for labeling, but I'm not sure on analysis. That's a really good question that would I'd be interested to hear. Why don't you um, list in the chat if any of you have had a nutritional analysis. So this is um, rlfoodtestinglabs.com and uh, they also do uh, food testing. They do food labels as well, though. So uh, this would be, you'd get both of them in one company, which you don't get with Nutridata. Nutridata is just going to do the nutrient analysis. Well, they, well, that's not true. They also have a label feature as well, but I'm going to show you ones where you can just get labels done. So um, I would highly recommend you take a look at, um, at what these different companies just, you know, it's worth checking them out. And if it's something that you feel like you want to take your cottage industry to the next level, it, you know, it might be that next level step that you take. You've got a proven product. And by the way, we have done a nutrient analysis on this product. Another big component is, is, is labeling. And this is, this is much more approachable because I have a free a free label maker for you. So, uh, and I've used it quite a bit in my extension work. So let's just go over the basics of um, how the label changed in 2020. You know, with the pandemic, it seems like this kind of skipped everybody's mind because we were so consumed with other parts of our life and work. So if you'll take a look at the label on the left, 
This is the previous label and uh, it had, uh, these may seem insignificant, but there was a lot of years and a lot of surveys went out to get these changed. Uh, they sent them out to a group of dietitians that I'm part of and we uh, were able to give some input to them as well. So on the left, uh, people were very confused about uh, the servings per container versus the serving size. So on the new label, the serving size, the recommended serving size is in bold. The recommended serving size, by the way, has nothing to do with what you should have for your age, health, weight. It's just the manufacturer saying, I think this is the serving size of cereal you should have. So that's something to be aware of. And then look what they did with the calorie information. It's very bold. Uh, they just want to get you to the place where you're really focused. Uh, they took out that calories from fat right by the calories because that's addressed down below. They're really trying to visually, sim visually simplify this label. And then the main categories of total fat, cholesterol, sodium, total carbohydrate and protein are the same. However, we have wanted to know for years what part of the sugar listing is added sugars. And unless you go through the ingredient list and know how to prepare foods and you really think about it, you're not going to capture how much is an added sugar in that product versus naturally occurring sugar. So for instance, if we were to have a label for, an, for orange juice, 100% orange juice, it would have a lot of sugars in it, but guess what? They're, they're naturally occurring sugars, they're not added. And so that means that the tree, <laughs> nature gave us that fructose in that fruit and nothing else has been added. So now we can know as consumers that which, uh, what amount of sugar has been added to that product that we're eating and they're doing it in a percent daily value that did not go away. However, all that extra information at the bottom of the, of the label went away. So basically they're telling us that the, that the percent daily value tells you that if uh, that the, what percent of that nutrient is represented in a 2000 calorie intake, not that that's your level of intake that's recommended. But for instance, in this label on the right, that um, three grams, grams of dietary fiber provides 11% of the fiber I need based on a 2000 calorie diet. So, you know, it takes a little bit of explaining, but um, that's the, I just wanted to get to the basics of a nutrition label. So let's take a look at where you can get a free label maker. Again, I mentioned that Nutridata has one and also uh, the food testing lab does as well. Um, there is a food and nutrition, uh, the FDA has a guide for general information. It's quite an extensive document, but I did reference it here for you and, and can definitely give you a link for that. But I just wanted to take you to the free label maker site because this is so simple to use. I would suggest that you try this at, for, for um, something you make, for instance. I would definitely try it. So we've done this in an extension. Say for instance, uh, I'll have a recipe come across my desk and I want to provide it to a group that I'm meeting with. I'll want to know what, what, what type of, I want to put a label on this peanut butter snack ball that I have. I make them all the time at home, but I don't have a nutrition label generator. So let's just take a look at how simple this is. So um, you just basically, um, which version of the label gener gener generator do you wanna use? You can also load a previous save label. And then look, you get to choose between these three label formats. Uh, do you want the abbreviated vertical? Do you want the long vertical? Or is your product such that it's a long product? Maybe it's a loaf of bread and you can actually have a horizontal label on your product. And so you select this and then it will just, let me just um, select one just for fun. And then um, step three will pop up and then you start 
entering the information. Um, if you don't know the information, you just skip it. And um, I know what the serving size, I want it to be two snack balls per serving, I'm just suggesting. And if you don't know any of the information, just leave it blank and uh, it can, you know, it can give you a label based on the information that you're putting into this tool. So we've used this on a couple of projects I've used uh, in extension and it's, it's quite helpful. If you want to go ahead and go back to either Nutridata or if you wanna to go to food, RL food testing, you can have them do a, a professional label for you as well. Do you have any questions for me right now? I definitely have more information I can share with you as far as taking a deep dive into the forms. I'm not sure, Jen, if that's what you're, the group would like to do. If they'd like to see the forms, I'd be happy to pull them up. Would you like me to do that? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to pull up a couple of forms that I think will be very helpful to you. So this is the fact sheet that the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare has put out. So basically it goes over the definition I gave you. It gives you what are the non-TCS foods or time control sensitive foods that uh, are allowed. And then it has a few little caveats at the end to give you a little bit more information about the um, foods that have a pH below 4.6 or a water activity below 0.85 do not require refrigeration. So those would be the foods that would go, that would be approved uh, in, uh, when you go through the process uh, to go through this food protection programs uh, website. And then I also wanted to share another form. I also wanted to ask you, Julie, about the polls, if you want to do those a little bit later. Yeah, I think, I think I'd like to do them um, just after I show this one right here. So this is, the, um, this is from the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. And uh, this is um, you, this is the form you'd use to have them assess your food. So basically there's no, uh, there's nothing you know, they're just gonna give you some feedback. This isn't an application, this is just an assessment. So basically you're gonna give some basic information about your business. You're gonna give a complete listing of what foods you want to, um, to, to sell from your cottage food industry. And uh, then the health district, this is what they're gonna fill out at the bottom. They're gonna determine if it's a low risk or a medium risk or a high risk. And they're going to tell you if you're exempt from licensure or if, you, if this food would be regulated under the Idaho Food Code and you have to get a food safety handler's permit and go a totally different avenue than uh, a cottage food industry. So I just want you to be aware of this form as well. All right, let's go and do some polls right now. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and launch some polls. I'd like you to complete these. This will help you get to know a little bit about yourself, get for me to get to know a little bit about you as well. So um, would someone that's participating, let me know if you can see the polls. Um, 
anyone that's a participant. Can you see the polls that are, oh, looks like you are. So there's three polls. Um, basically, I'm asking you in poll number one, which safe food safety certifications do you have? Check one or more. The second poll question is, how many of you have had a nutrition food analysis for at least one product you sell? So I've had four people answer that so far. Let's see if we can get some more people participating. And then the third poll question is, how many of you have a food label for at least one product you sell? This will just help me get an idea of where you guys are at along the process of your moving your cottage food product forward and uh, no judgment on my part at all. I'm just curious now that you know a little bit more about what you have available to you, if you, how many of you have actually done this so far? So I've had uh, eight, eight people respond. We have about 15 people on the call. So give you about another 30 seconds to go ahead and respond. And then I'll end the poll and we'll take a look and see where everybody's at. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. We've, we've had at least oh, a little over half of you respond. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the results. Okay, it looks like, um, Three of you have the food manager level exam from, Sur from Serve Safe, and five of you don't have any type of food safety certification. And uh, hopefully that's something you'll consider. I know it's not mandated, um, but it's definitely recommended. So hopefully you'll take a look at the one that we have at University of Idaho that's free, Ready, Set, Food Safe. The second poll question is, how many of you have had a nutrition food analysis for at least one of your products? Um, and none of you that participated have had one. And how many of you have a food label for at least one of your products? One out of the eight that responded do. So thank you for responding. That's, that's very helpful to me to take a look at that. Can you explain? Um the difference between the labeling requirements with cottage food versus if you were to sell wholesale? Yeah, let's take a look at uh, the USDA's guidance there. They have a really good um, form there that I wanna take a look at. That's a good question. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull this up and then I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay, this is from the US Food and Drug Administration. So this is from the FDA. And there's um, guidance here that uh, tells you about the food labeling questions. So Basically, um, if if you're going to sell if you're going to sell outside of the cottage food industry, so cottage food industry means I'm selling direct from person to person. I'm a cottage food industry. I'm meeting you at a booth. You're stopping at the food at the farmers market, and it's a direct sell. Uh, that that. Uh, is the label is not required. It's definitely would be a great product to have. But if you go to the place of selling commercially where you are not in the presence of the person who's buying from you, you must have a label. And that's the short answer that I, I think you want. But this is where you're going to get all of that information um, about 
the guidance for that, but that's the short answer for sure. Do you know um, about selling honey? And um, I've seen lots of products sold that say raw honey. Um, it doesn't have a nutrition label on it or anything, but it is, you know, it's one of the cottage food, foods, <laughs> the cottage food is a cottage food. Um, do you know anything about that? Yeah, it's right here. Let me see if I can find the, On the list of acceptable cottage food foods, um, honey is listed. So the answer is yes, you can sell that as a cottage food. Uh, what was the other part of your question, Jen? Um, but if you were to sell it in like a retail store, is there, do you have to get the label and all that? Yes, definitely, yes. No longer cottage food industry at that point, it's a commercial endeavor, yes. It's only direct to consumer sales. Correct. Any and other questions? Know, uh, another thing, do you know about, I mean, obviously it might vary with each local jurisdiction, but when selling cottage foods, um, technically you're supposed to take sales tax too and give it, like if you're in a city, do you know anything? I mean, now that's getting outside of food safety, but definitely considerations when you're trying to sell uh, to your customers. Yeah, that is not something that I, I can speak to with authority. I, I know what they're doing when I purchase a cottage food, but I don't know if they're in compliance about that. So I can't, I can't answer that. Um, I think that if we wanted, uh, Juan, um, does have some errands. He could probably join us earlier for some questions if, if he is available. I don't know if Juan can hear me. I can text him too. That would be um, great. Thank you for your time and attention. And if there's anything I can do to uh, help you along the process, you can definitely reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat and I'll, I'll hang on, Jen, to see if there's other questions that come up. Um, I have a question. Okay. My name is Lisa. Yes. And um, I'm in cottage food right now. And I do put a label on my product. Uh, cause I sort, I do chocolate. So I put the, what's in the chocolate. I put what's in the toffee that I put in and things like that. If I go wholesale, does the label have to be broken down? Like you showed by how many calories, how much sugar, how much this, how much that, or is it still okay just to list the ingredients? At that point, you, you're going to have to have a nutrition fact label when you go commercial. And that I, do have to, I have to have a uh, fact label. Yes. Okay. 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 Is, is Juan available? I know he was running some errands and it looks like he's still on, a, on our call. Um, I am going to pull up my screen. Let's see. Let's see if he's going to join us. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen real fast. Hello, hello. Hi, Juan. I have some questions for you. I'm going to pull my questions up. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. Let's see. Um, okay. Um, so with these classes, it's so helpful to have people who are like boots on the ground doing this work. 
Yeah, um, of course. Hearing from their experience, and um, we're very fortunate to have Juan Morales join us today. Um, <laughs> That's suit of you guys. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And as you can hear, he is a very busy entrepreneur. <laughs> um, the work never stops. <laughs> he lived here locally in Teton Valley. And back in 2017, I believe, when I first started doing these food business classes locally in my community, he did attend some of our classes. He was just getting started. So it's been really neat for me as an educator, just living in the community to see the progression of his business um, and his and his family business as well, and all the, the work that they've been doing in our local community. So on our screen, um, we there's a website and you can check out his products there. Um, and as we get started, I'd love to hear from Juan, um, just a brief introduction about yourself and your business and your products. Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, first of all, again, thank you guys for having me. It's, uh, um, it's my pleasure to, to be a part of, of any kind of an educational uh, aspect, you know, um, classes where uh, minimum I could be of any service or any assistance. But second, like, most importantly, um, that people that are interested in, um, in educating themselves in, in the industry, um, you know, could get some, could gather some information. Um, it did take me, I think, I started about 2015 um, to start developing um, some of our, our products. You guys probably know me from Rosas Tamales, our, our, our hot food catering tamales business and hot salsa. Yeah. And then um, Naughty Fruit kind of uh, was a, a child, I guess, born after that, just with the fruit cups and stuff. Um, so it's it's taken me some years to organize, to to get to this level, I guess, of processing and manufacturing and then to get into a bunch of stores. Um, so it's not, doesn't take a, a month or a day or a week or, or even a year maybe you can um but there's a lot of research behind it that uh um listening to this presentation earlier uh, it's just fantastic you know, this this stuff takes time takes experience and, and some of us don't have it so we have to look look for it so i'm so happy to be part of this this is, this is wonderful um thank you guys for having me these are amazing resources um that uh, that, that 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 our your guest prior uh, presented so ladies and gentlemen please take advantage of those links um, I taught myself a lot of this stuff, asking uh, questions in front of health and um, when, when getting into, uh, I guess, creating a label, um, if anything, just creating a bag, you know, what do I need to do? What do I need to have? Um, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's hard because not only are you finding the information, looking for information uh, on what it look, needs to look like and so on and so forth, um, but, uh, but it has to be, you know, uh, on the level, it has to be uh, appropriately um, organized and, and and of course food handling is a whole other different diff, different ball game you have to make sure that this stuff is is food safe and the hand washing um that's why if you know me my hands are really rough because i'm washing my hands like every five minutes if not more on top of that the the, the, the bleach water solution but um yeah so so naughty fruit is my business uh this is my second it's my second um i guess food product product project it's my first that I'm taking into grocery stores, um, and it's my baby. <laughs> She's my baby. So um, it's a dehydrated spice fruit snack. It's made here in Driggs, Idaho, um, and I, I, I built a, a commercial kitchen just so that we can process this, uh, you know, nutty fruits um, with all the legality and so on and so forth. Um, but I've been here in the valley for some time, and uh, you know, my heart and soul is is into every little little bag um, of naughty food. Um, so that's who I am. So um, what gave you like the impetus or the idea to start with dehydrated fruits to begin with? And I know that um, when you market your product, you're really um, saying like Teton Valley, I know with your apples, you've been showcasing the producers where you get your apples from and that's local, locally grown apples. I'd love sure. to hear a little bit about that. Sure. Um, what, well, part of the main reason what, why I got into dry fruit, um, my, my, my father, and I mean, we grew up in, in California where, where my father was a, is a, is a laborer. I mean, um, first, you know, first migrant moving over to work uh, in, the, in the fields all day, every day for many, many years. So fruit was always in our, in our life. Um, and then we moved out here to the Valley um, 97. 
a little bit before the 2000s. And so, you know, one thing led to another. Um, we, I got into the fruit because I, I about a, I said four or five years ago, um, you know, came back to work, help out my, my family. My dad got his back broken, started to work, you know, help out the family. And then, you know, eventually I'm like, you know, what can, what can I create? How can I be involved in the community as, as I like to be, um, where I can be uh, of service, I can, I can be an asset, I can, I can provide something some services whatever where where you know where we can create something that I, we can that i can be proud of that we can be proud of and obviously you know there's chips and there's doritos and, there, and there's drinks and, and soda pops and all these you know stuff out there in the market um and we were all used to the whole trail mix concept where you know, there's a bunch of little sugar packed um fruits that last a long time but they, you know, they, they give you the energy to hike and so on so forth which is fantastic but it's not necessarily um, anything new. It's not necessarily anything that's based on nutrients. You know, it's just, it's been created many, many years ago and why it's something that's not broken. So I decided to make my own stuff. Like I want to have nutrient dense dry fruit. I want to have tasty, you know, fruit, um, palatable, um, which is why we, I ended up doing spice to it. So the and chili pepper. Um, and I, I just wanted to be, I want to do something that wasn't just good for you, but, um, one, we could, we could use local products, you know, in the area. So apples and pears are from Marching, Idaho or from Quincy and like unique enough to where it's tasty and powerful. When you can take it on a, you know, on a hike, which a lot of us do that. We, we go, we go by bicycling, we go canoeing in the summer, um, we, you know, living out here. It's like heaven for a lot of people. That's why we come here. So why not, you know, take something on the hike that one won't, won't spoil. And two, you know, it's tasty and palatable. And three, it's even it's nutrient dense. You know, it's, it's, it's healthy for you. So the, the idea was like, how can I create something, or what can I create that one day will be, you know, will be uh, uh, good for the environment, you know, good for good for the community, good for the body. And someday, you know, I, I'll grow it enough. I can say that that's not, that ninety percent of my product, and, and we and we love what we do when we're and we're producing good stuff, not just sugar heavy or you know um, there's something that's not that's not good for you. Um, and so like that's that's why I started like years ago, and I just started to ask questions everywhere. <laughs> How do I do this? Where do I do that? What do I have to legally have? And like from an LLC, small company to to you know to food grade processing to. To, to, to bleed strips like everything you want because you have to pretty much um once you start producing volume you have to make sure that quality is key and that comes with not only the food product but also um the process and how you do it uh, hair follicles can't be on people's food <laughs> it's not okay uh you know having long nails isn't clean because you know, they'll get stuff in between them so stuff like that um but yeah i i, I started it because I, I wanted to be a part of this community where I can provide something that's unique, wonderful, great, and someday, you know, a big deal. Hey, Juan. Um, how did I'm really curious, like how you went about making your your packages, and if you did start with like the cottage food um, production and selling direct sure. to consumer, or if you went ahead and went sure. straight to retail, and your whole process for that. Sure. Um, well, my first bag, if any of you guys have been around for that long, uh, was a plastic bag with a sticker on it. <laughs> and it, said, it had our information, Naughty Fruit, contact this number, and that's about it. Um, th I think right now we're, we're at our fourth to our fifth um, design redesign. Um, and like I said, um, after you know, getting to know the Department of Health in the area, both Wyoming and in Idaho, and after asking you know, everybody questions about how they do their thing, um kate's tram bars kate is has been an asset to my to my learning process yeah i, I literally called up kate like three or four times sent her an email eventually we met up at a, at a, at a local party um, and you know she put a face to my name and i said look kate your stuff is awesome obviously it's different than mine how, what do i how do i get to where you you know where you're at now and this was you know before she she went you know she went national um and she just was wonderful she was such a sweet lady and i love her and i have her on speed dial um yeah. so you you just seek out people um that do similar things that you do um and the majority of the time when you ask for help you receive it i mean in this community if you guys are familiar with it people are friendly people are sweet the majority of the time people want to help each other but the concept is asking you know it's hard to ask 
So I told myself years ago that I'm, I'm not going to be afraid of putting myself out there. And I just asked. Um, so um, once I think I spoke to her a, a little bit after it, and then previous to her as well, I started to figure out like, one, I need to make sure that um, our bags, logos, and labels after looking at a bunch of links and excuse me, other people's, other people's products. Um, you know, we, you, you have to apply, obviously, you have to apply a nutritional aspect of, to it. You have to write you know, a story, uh, ingredients, uh, you know, all the stuff that, one, represent your product. Um, I've also spent a lot of money uh, processing. I'm sending it to labs, you know, to make sure that there's, there's an average of this much sugar in it, this much protein, so on and so forth. To this by law, you have to, you have to do that. So, you know, follow the laws, follow, follow the requirements. Um, identify how you know they fit to to your products whether it's beverage or uh, fermented or alcohols or base all that stuff um and then just start asking questions um i i said this is like my third or my yes i think it's my fourth redesign because they're going from a plastic uh plastic you know um, back to now having biodegradable which to me again to us biodegradable is is extremely important it's, 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 it's a big deal for me um, and so, you know, it's part of what I want and it costs a little more money, but um, not, no, not the price of, of, of the environment. Uh, so I don't mind paying more, um, but uh, you know, you just ask questions, you, you look up, but the links um, that are on the, that are on here um, are amazing. I, I saw, and I, I know more for those. Um, like I said, uh, I did start at, as a cottage license uh, because it's dry good. Um, I don't manage animal byproducts. We don't we don't use nuts um, of any sort. Um, we don't manage yeah milk or cheese. So for us, having a dry good, uh, it's it, it's what we consider low risk uh, in the food industry, as opposed to you know, ferments, alcohol based um, food by no, animal animal by animal products byproducts. Um, but definitely do your homework and 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 search it because if you create it, if if you envision it. Um, with you know, with the idea of wanting to grow and expand, and and, and you put all your intent with good intent to want to be, one day I want to be, um, you know, such and such grocery store or or again for me it was it was Whole Foods. Um, one day I want to be you know selling X many volume, and be some be somewhere big. It requires certain legalities to get there with the packaging so on and so forth. So just like ask a million questions to anybody that's willing to to, to listen. Um, and you know, and just get after it. Like, there's no reason why you shouldn't, uh, you know, go out and ask, um, or even check check out the links and and just you know ask questions on the links. Thank you. I'm I'm curious how you um, or, or excuse me, how or where do you sell your product right now? And 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 you talked a bit about the evolution of it. Um, did you start with like a farmer's market or were you selling sure. a lot of your like online? And then gotcha. if you're doing online, then you have to get go through the whole USDA process, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. So so I started um in at, at the at the farmers markets. Again, you guys probably know a lot of people you guys know me from Ros Tamales, from selling hot foods, tamales, uh, in our in our, our, our and then fruit cups. Um we the leftover fruit cups that wasn't the, the fruit that wasn't ready to process uh, you know, then I dehydrated and then it became a thing and then I started to have tamales salsa and then next to like you know these bags of dry fruit and so that was a good way to you know I gave bags away more than anything just to get sample concepts ideas you know people didn't know what they think about uh, and so on and so forth and then people wanted to have like you know can we have like 10 20 bags because we were doing a family flow blah blah and then that became a thing and then I think my, my first vendors, uh, actually Eco Tours in Boy in, in, in Jackson, uh, has been one of my was my first client and has been one of my most strongest supporters. So love them for that. Um, but yeah, it was farmer markets, and then it was, um, and, and then I obviously create the, the website online, and then that was the thing. You know, Start to promote that, and website's a whole different other monster. You want to make sure you get after. Um, but again, the, the basic the basic concepts of it is once you get into a resale concept, not not a direct sale as as, as a farmer's market or, or, a, or a website is, once you start to resell, once it goes from your your hands to another seller's hands to the client, then you have the legality, then you have the FDA, then you have you you have you know all these other requirements that by law need to be covered because God forbid someone gets sick on what, on what you're consuming. 
And it all has to lead down to, well, who's making it? So and so forth. Nobody wants to have a blame, which is fair. And so when, when it's third party, what we can say third party. So in resale, Whole Foods, uh, Chaps Club, Walmart, you know, any mom and pop shop, um, you have to make sure that all of the data is on there and that you're, you're upkeeping with your Department of Health um, requirements per se. Um, but uh, now we're shooting for, uh, for Albertsons. Um, Albertsons in Boise. Uh, I actually just came back from a, from a pitch, kind of a pitch day from them, kind of a Shark Tank type of spiel. Um, we're supposed to find out like in the next couple of days if, if, I, if I won or not <laughs> um, with a bunch of other uh, local um, Idaho producers, um, which is, you know, and then you, you obviously it's a prize money, but then you get recognition and then, then you can get funded to Albertsons, which is a whole other business market. So hopefully um, in about a week, I'll be feeling amazing and saying that I got a contract with, with Albertsons in Boise. And, and, and in a couple of days, I'll be like, hey, I won. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, yeah, the, the, the important concept is one, create a vision, a plan where you say, you know, I make uh, muffins and my friends and my family members say, I'll say that they're good and the local mom and pop shop says those are good and they're selling. Where do I want to be? You know, who do I want to sell this eventually to? Whether it's like I said, Whole Foods. For me, it was Whole Foods, um, and and just like talk to them, talk to the managers, talk to the the, the owners, and say hi. My name's so and so. I sell muffins. Um, what do I need to do to be able to have my muffins on your shelf? Volumes, blah blah blah. And and then once they tell you what they re- what they require, what they need, then you start to work backwards and be like, okay, well, they're asking for you know, let's say two dozen a day. Or a coffee shop or whatever, two is in a day. And we require FDA, we require uh, from the health and da, 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 all these different points. That's where you start to, you know, before you buy big machinery and, and then mold and all that stuff, because it costs money to buy machinery and kick more decisions, work backwards that way. Um, and obviously, you know, you want to give samples and, 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 and at some point, people have to respond to where, wow, these are good. I would be happy to sell these in my shop. Or, or, you know, people start contacting you because their markets are so great. Or in this case, not a food. You know, your food's are great. Um, but work backwards because having said, I'm going to go get a kitchen and I'm going to buy this machine and that machine, that costs a lot of money, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars before you even have, you even have uh, um, interest. Um, but that, that, that's, a, that's a lot of change to, that's a lot of money to, um, to see if things work out, right? As opposed to like, fantastic, local shop in Driggs uh, wants to carry us. They want 100 bags of fruit uh, every month or, or, or something or other like that. Um, they're, they're paying this much money per, per bag. Um, I need to buy this, this, and this, if that answers your question. So I'm in, I'm in a couple yeah. different retailers. What was that contest again? You said it was, was it a local Albertsons in Boise and it's for Idaho mm-hmm. producers? Is it with Idaho preferred? Yeah. Well, well no, so I don't, um, no, so, so this is called, um, trail mix 2021, 2020, I guess, and, um, and it is a, a version of Shark Tank, but for Idaho manufacturers, packagers, co-packers, creators. Um, it is put together, I believe, I'm, I'm blanking right now. Uh, I've, I've been so nervous in the last few days just to find out if I win or not. Um, but it is put together by a local nonprofit in Jackson. I mean, I'm sorry, in Boise that, that, that helps local, like local, you know, they, they're kind of like an SBA, like, like a small business association, but like actual Boise. Um, it's gonna kill me. Trail mix is uh, it's gonna kill me if I if I don't get their name. I'm gonna feel like a jerk. Um, <laughs> I've been doing like twenty thousand things at once. Um, but uh, they are, um, I believe they're a nonprofit. Uh, the gentleman that runs it, his name is TM, and it's just it's 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 local comp- It's local. Um, it, it's it's kind of like Silicon Couloir in Jackson. So um, local investors, uh, business owners. A um, bunch of resources for, for small businesses, support other businesses that are growing and stuff and expanding. Um, it's going to kill me. Um, if I don't get the name, I feel terrible. Um, it's going to be, here it is. Um, so this is with... You can email me it too. Yeah, I feel so bad and I'm like, ah. uh, Tromix is an event. I hear this. And then it's going to be... Uh, not even for uh, oh, so it, this is called Trailhead Boise. So trailheadboise.org is, is a nonprofit. Um, and again, it's, it's a bunch of, you know, you apply for it, it works uh, to compete. So it's similar to Shark Tank. And then the prize winner is $25,000. The second winner is $5,000. And that goes to the company that wins. And then they get funneled to 
through to uh, to Albertsons in the area, and Albertsons is doing their best to compete with with both and so on and so forth. So, you know, they want to they want to start getting into locally made, naturally made products and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, it's called tra Trailhead Boise. Um, dot org, which is a nonprofit. Uh, Juan, um, where did you did did you participate in the Jackson Silicon Coolard? Um, those of you who are on this call from other areas in the state, our local community has, um, not only do we have a large philanthropic community between Teton Valley, Idaho and Jackson Hole, Wyoming, but there's a big business uh, development community and there's different nonprofits and organiza organizations, even um, governmental, governmental organizations that are partnering to try to help develop leadership and um, skills around um, uh, entrepreneurship. And I'm just curious, Juan, um, if you did partic or participate in any of those trainings and um, because I, I've been kind of watching from the periphery and what you've been doing. I know you first, you started coming to our food business classes back when we had the Teton Valley Kitchen. Um, I'm curious, like how you, uh, you said that you're like self-taught, um, how you kind of approached all that and developed your business plan. And this is kind of relating to the other webinars that we've had in this series. He's on mute. <laughs> oh, there you go. Ma, there you go. Are we back on? Sorry about that. Okay. Is this, is, is that good? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, So fantastic. did you so, take any of those that. leadership and business development? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, Silicon Couloir puts together this. Um, um, it's called the Startup Institute program. So, um, I was I was actually for the first class they gave. I think it's 2012. Um, I was one of the first um, students for that startup, um, and it, it was it was a, a, a 10 week intensive where you would go in for uh, things like a few hours a, a day for like two three days a week, um, and they would give you. From from idea concept to to final um, to you know first or second round of, of investors, the whole concept on, on what would be the best practices for you to open a business, increase your business, or, or you know expand your business depending on where you're at. Um, so I was one of the first students for for that first program, and now you know now I think they're like on the eighth or ninth um, year, but uh, no, it was it, it was it was a strong basis to um, to my knowledge of where I'm at now. Um, and, and part of it, the self-taught, uh, and I mean self-taught by, if I don't know this, I will figure it out, whether it's through friends and family members or online links or Shark Tank, you know, on TV or Netflix, whatever. Um, I've all, I've, for many years now, I've always identified, if you want to figure something out, go figure it out. There, there's no excuse um, to not get off your butt and go get it, go, get, go figure it out, go get it done. But Silicon Core was a huge, huge, huge um, uh, step up for, for me to learn um, uh, uh, efficient and effective practices to focus on what, you know, your business should look like or, you know, can be or can expand by. Um, on top of that, you know, once you get that concept of, you know, okay, that's you know, teaching me so much and whatever I gather. Um, then you know. Then you continue to 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 learn. You continue to look for for um, mentors for for programs. Um, I think a couple of years ago, I, yeah, I went to one. Of, I, I do my best to to get involved with the community. Um, and again, self like no one's gonna teach you, tell you what to do and how to do it right or what you know where to where to buy and what to buy or what to invest. You have to identify that for yourself. So I, I took myself to a couple of the meetings with you guys just to you know get to know. Um, what you guys were doing uh, services wise, but also uh, who else is involved. And again, I learned a couple of new things, you know, there that, that, that I hadn't learned before. And, and then I'm, I'm always uh, looking for, uh, again, online practices, how, how to sell and resell online and, and, and season, you know, Christmas and so on and so forth. And so the idea is to always constantly be uh, learning something new about yourself on top of your business, because you are part of your business, you are your business. And so it's key whether you're doing audiobooks on you know on your drives, or you're going to seminars, or you're traveling, you know, uh, to Costa Rica to look at pineapple and farms, uh, you know, because I wanted to learn about pineapples and farms because of my business. So the idea is to continue to to, to keep on educating yourself um, and do these programs. I mean, when you hear the word free, uh, take it, 
go for it. Uh, especially if there's resources that um, are going to improve getting to the next level or helping you with packaging or helping you with, you know, Department of Health stuff. It's required in food industry to be aware of processes and storage and, and a bunch of stuff like that. Get after it. You know, learn it, take advantage of it, and get involved. Um, we have a question from someone on the webinar. It's from Lisa G. She asks, uh, when you get your product in a store, do they assist in marketing or other promotions? Sure. Uh, hi, Lisa G. Thank you for that question. Uh, thanks for being on here. Um, the I guess I guess it depends. So um, an example. So Whole Foods in Jackson, um, they're they're hugely focused on local local consumers, local business, and so they they do some marketing um, on the shelves right next to your products. At least they did for me, where they 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 had they had a picture and they and they put me on there and, and they told my story. This is a local person, and you know they do as much as they can for them to be able to move, move product. Um, Eco Tours, uh, it's a it's a um, it's a it's a local touring company. Uh, in, in the area in Jackson for tour guides and you know they they want to be able to promote local local support local, local products obviously when they go on these tours like five six hour tours people are hungry so they create lunches and so you know I, they put me there because one I'm a local guy it's 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 a good snack for the outdoors and so they give I think a bag to each client that they get in the summer and that's quite a bit back so it's pretty busy so it just depends on what the on what the um the clients for me clients being my, my selling resource uh, Whole Foods or uh, you know uh, Victor Valley grocery store and so forth um there usually is some kind of marketing here or there some kind of uh, space and you know they they provide you know the um, the images or the, or the or the promotion on on the newspapers and so on and so forth. It just depends on, on who you're working with, uh, and uh, you know, and what they expect from you. And then you know, you can also like buy uh, shelves that are like self-standing at the end of the aisles. And so it just depends on the the on the on, on the seller, reseller, excuse me. Thanks. Um, this might be a question both for you, Juan, and maybe Julie. Um, mm -hmm. With the supply chain crunch yeah. that we're currently in, and I know that. Um, in Teton Valley, I believe it was Sodexo that had um, reduced their stops to Teton Valley. Um, what, did you guys, what, what have you experienced with that? And are you finding any sort of um, impacts to your product and to your business with just the shipping delay and the supply chain issues we're currently experiencing? Julie, would you like to give me your comment? I don't, I don't have a comment. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, uh, for, for us, for Naughty Fruits, um, we're at the point where we focus strongly on community, on local. Um, I guess uh, lowest hanging fruit, right? Why, why try to focus on shipping to another state when there's a lot of business here? So we've been pushing forward on... I guess let's say worst case scenario, 200 mile radius. Um, and so we ha I haven't had an issue with uh, with shipping and, and and materials. I the the goal for for our production is also to be ahead of what we you know project what we might sell next year. So when you buy bags uh, in bulk, usually it's, it's in volume, 20,000 units and so on and so forth, depending on what you're what you're, what you're producing. You usually want to acquire stock. You, know, you wanna you wanna buy volume so that we it can carry you over for let's say let's say you buy material for a year but hopefully you sell that in three months you know it depends on, on on the volumes that you're trying to push push out but um we have all of our stuff all of our, our um about to get our bags in, in stock um the only thing that we have to worry about is uh is temperature so the weather changes then we have to deal with with fruit freezing mango and pineapple don't do really well with the cold and then the outcome of our product changes slightly which I don't I don't I don't like then you know I change the flavor so, so but other than that uh, I usually create the the box for my clients I drive it over to Jackson um, I do U, U, USPS post service and I do um, uh, UPS so we haven't had an issue with that um, but I can see how it can be an issue with other companies that are maybe doing a lot more volume than they are um, where they're bringing in stuff from from, from China or uh, from other countries to to get you know bulk products or even you know shipping out as well. But we haven't had that issue yet, which I'm happy to, to announce that. I, I thought of a comment, um, if, if I can. Uh, having a major 
supply problem with two two part canning lids, and you know uh, I know that um, glass. Uh, I just got a notice that jars or glass uh, of any kind. So if you buy spaghetti sauce and glass jars, then those are going to start being limited. You'll have to be limited to more of a um, tomato tomato sauce in a can. So I would just be, you know, if you're thinking about 2022 and I would get on getting the supplies, you know, the non-food supplies that you need, the, the containers and uh, it, it's, I just don't see it easing up. We've had such a problem with um, home food production uh, supplies and it's continued through this second year of the pandemic. And um, I'm curious if there are other people here um, on this call that are that did experience like reductions in um, just distribution. Like, so I know that a lot of our restaurants, for instance, they kind of came together. Um, they formed a restaurant association here in Teton Valley. They were trying to share ordering of food because. Um, in our area in particular, and I think this is all, you know, it all trickles down and it has to do with the supply chain issues that we're current, are currently experiencing nationwide is that there were less stops to Teton Valley. So Sodexo was used to deliver several times a week and they were not delivering anymore. A lot of our restaurants uh, were not able to get the goods that they needed. They were having to reduce their menus and take items off of their menu. Um, so I'm curious if there's anybody here on this call that um, has experienced that and then um, how they're maybe going about trying to like collectively solve this issue or um, just even considerations as people get started. Uh, this is Lisa in my yeah. business. I pack in mason jars and I um, use very nice colorful lids. So I'm finding that, yeah, there's times that I can't get a certain lid. But the minute they tell me they have it in stock, I have to buy larger quantities and plan ahead. So as far as mason jars go, yeah, they're hard. So I just look everywhere to source. And we have a company right now, we have, you know, I think, I think 40, 50 cases on back order. And we're hoping to get them, because um, I do a smaller jar, four ounce and eight ounce. So you just have to plan um, your budget and really look ahead and stock up when you can get what you want to get. Or I might have to do what Juan did and look at revamping my uh, look. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> glass. Lisa. Yeah, I, I definitely know that, that the whole supply chain just with like mason jars and it was lids last year, we couldn't get lids anywhere. Um, and then now I've heard with like just the glass jars, um, we have a local company in Teton Valley that does, um, they're a, was it a micro cidery? Is that, am I saying that right? They do local cider and they um, have had to reduce or kind of change their packaging um, based on glass and, and that sort of thing. Um, and it, it's been really interesting to kind of watch this on the periphery and um, I'm, I, I know that with our restaurants, they kind of had to work together. They're like, okay, I'm going to do a big bulk order. Any other restaurants want to kind of jump in and join in on this order so that we can have a greater quantity when we're ordering because they were the, the delivery, um, from Sodexo was um, coming a lot less frequently and they were doing less stops as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all really interesting. Um, and I'm happy to share any information that you guys may have to help. Um, Can I jump in real quick? This. Yes. So um, one one of the best things that I that I learned, and, and yes, I, jars are a big issue. Uh, they happened for the last year and a half. One of the best things that I have learned from this whole chaos, from from when we first started with COVID to, to now, you know, living through it and so on and so forth, is um, if 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 you can't be open to, to change to 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 you know, move your 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 ideas to to being open to other things, you, you're gonna sink. So one of the best things that I can say is if this is a great opportunity for a lot of you guys to reanalyze your business, to reanalyze your packaging, to reanalyze 
um, you know, change, change the, change the whole game. Um, again, fortunately um, for us, you know, I, I've been doing this for, I've been doing this, this, this commercial volume now for, I think uh, going on a third year right before COVID. And at some point I was able to get volume for, for biodegradable so on and so forth. And, you know, these options were becoming available. Um, and so that, that kind of saved my butt, but be, be okay with maybe your jar isn't, isn't going to be the same as what you envision in your head. Maybe try something different, you know, but work with other things because sometimes we, we just can't get what we need and you have to go out of town or out of state if and, if and when, or again, you have to buy a pallet of jars. You know, how many of us can storage a pallet of jars that are very heavy and they're, you just can't, you can't always do that. Um, you know, kick the kids out of the house and you have a room, you know, there you go. But, um, you know, sometimes you just, you have to change with the times. You might have to, you know, use something different. Um, but don't be afraid to looking around, asking around for something, maybe perhaps that might not be HR, at least for now. Um, and pivoting a little bit. Um, make it work, you know. Um, before we let you go, I'm wondering um, what your goals are for your business. They're like short-term and maybe long-term goals. Sure, for sure. Um, awesome. So short-term is uh, keep on, keep on, uh, you know, keep on pushing, keep on selling, uh, expanding the mark, the brand to not only to Idaho but to you know maybe a couple other states. Um, Jackson, obviously Wyoming, and um, we we also been. More Working with QFT quality food distributing in Montana, but you know they've been carrying us in Montana, Missoula, and other places. Um, the long term, preferably, um, would be to to become a national brand, um, create a a factory in the valley, um, kind of like what Kate did with with, with Tram Bars, um, create a create a factory in the, in the valley, and you know, increase hopefully, obviously. Increase our production of local consumables, so, so apples and pears, peaches. Get get into, um, you know, working with our neighbors, our our local farmers, because local local business is so crucial right now. And you know, you get just as good quality as you would from some other you know farmer in California you know, shipping in products. Um, increasing our volume here. Um, keep providing great quality uh, even with the uh, with the volume. Um, things tend to change when you start doing you know machinery when you start cutting things in machinery and so forth, but. The quality increase increase our sales. Um, uh, I'm gonna be I'm so so creating a building a factory. Is from my understanding, is very expensive, especially when land is going up. It has been for the last few few months. Um, so so just trying to sort that out right, um, at the moment. Um, and uh, you know, one day, hopefully one day, maybe a couple years from now, um, we'll be a national national you know American brand, um, and then a lot of our stuff can extend you know still be uh, processed here in the U.S. Uh, obviously, some products we can. We, we don't grow bananas. We don't grow, you know, dragon fruits and so forth. But still get a good balance of, of um, producing local um, and expand and, you know, just uh, keep keep the concept of we want to be low waste. We want to be nutrient dense. Uh, we want to be in Idaho. Um, and, you know, we just want to be able to provide a great healthy snack to uh, option, you know, option for, for, for our youth as well as uh, hikers and family people and moms and grandpas and all the above. And so um, keep on, keep on pushing up and super high, super excited that, you know, we're, that I, that I can, that we can produce locally, uh, you know, within reason, obviously. Uh, but yeah, yeah, just expand and, and get some money from into, into being a household item, hopefully in the next, in the next three to four years. So yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, do any of you on this call have questions for Juan before he takes off? Anybody? Even in Spanish. <laughs> I speak Spanish, so I'd be happy to help you guys in Spanish. Yeah, I wanted to, um, that's a good segue. There, there are some University of Idaho classes on entrepreneurship. I have a colleague, Paul Lewin, um, who is from Chile, and he developed all sorts of food entrepreneur, um, or actually not just say food entrepreneur, but just um, small business entrepreneur classes with the University of Idaho Extension. And he has translated those courses into Spanish. They're self-paced courses. Um, I, I sent out a link 
back before September 30th with a link to the University of Idaho classes. Um, but if you guys are interested uh, and you didn't get that, email me, uh, jwerlin at uidaho.edu. I will make sure to send that to you. And they're self-paced classes. Um, and we're really happy to be able to expand those offerings in Spanish um, and, and be more inclusive. Um, so uh, any other questions for Julie before Julie takes off as well? Um, we can also, you know, I'm looking here in the chat. If you have a chat feature, you can do that too. I'm going to go to the next slide. Let's see. There we go. So we have um, another webinar. It's next week. It's going to be on October 21st on marketing and distribution. So it's the last one in our series. And um, we're going to have representatives from the University of Idaho Food Technology Center. That is located in Caldwell, Idaho. And they have been a wonderful educational resource for food entrepreneurs in our state. They have um, trainings that they do for people who wanna get their products started. They help them with nutritional analysis, take them through the process of labeling, and um, they serve as an incubator space. So there's definitely um, business entrepreneurs that are renting out parts of that facility and they're starting to move their product um, <clears throat> into the market that way. Uh, we'll have representatives from them. Hopefully we'll get some folks from Idaho Preferred, which is the marketing branch with ISDA to promote uh, Idaho grown and Idaho produced products. Um, and so it's a very good uh, workshop to attend um, if you are learning more about or need a little bit more information about that. We do have uh, recordings to all of the webinars so far. So if you missed those, send me again, another email. Um, and I do wanna ask you guys to please take our end of class um, survey evaluations. We haven't had very many uh, return to us so far, maybe 5% of those of you have uh, joined in on the classes. Um, I have sent off those uh, evaluation links um, in my emails. Those are really important for us so that we can continue to show impact to our funders and to be able to continue to offer these classes down the road. It shouldn't take you very long, um, maybe five minutes at, at, at most. Um, if you have your smartphone, an easy way to do that is just take your phone, get the camera feature, and then just scan it over that QR code. Um, you can also, um, I'll type in here in the, the chat box, the, the direct link, the URL. And this is for the survey for today's class. Um, oh, it didn't all go through. Hey, hey Jen. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry to interrupt. Um, I had to get going, but I want to just say, guys, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's it's my pleasure to be of, of service and of help. Um, if you guys have any questions, concerns, or suggestions, um, you know, let me know. C call me. I'm, I'm always usually pretty free um, on a text or a phone call. Um, and again, thanks for your support, guys. Thanks for being here. Uh, Julie, your, your information is fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, if I had this information, you know, years ago, life would have been a lot easier for me. But you know, I'm glad you that you're doing this now, and that, and that you guys are on the on the on the webinar. Are hopefully take advantage of that, please. It will save you time, it will save you money, and it will save you a lot of stress, which we can all use right now. Um, thanks again for your guys support, guys. Uh, check out our website, naughtyfood.com. We have some fantastic gift baskets that we put together with our naughty food, but with other other local vendors, honeys, uh, jams, uh, chocolate stone, and so forth. And we send them, we're sending them out for the holidays, so uh, definitely check us out. And um, yeah, thanks for having me, Jennifer. I appreciate it. And you guys, best of luck with everything else, guys. Keep at it. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. All right. So, um, yeah, please take this survey. It shouldn't take you more than just a few minutes. It's not even, it's like maybe 10 questions at most, multiple choice. Uh, you should be able to whiz through it really fast. Um, it definitely helps us as educators to be able to continue to offer these courses. Um, and if you do have any ideas of what you liked and didn't like, um, and, and if there's trainings that you are interested in having, please reach out to us. Um, myself and the other and my other colleagues who have been doing these uh, this food entrepreneur series are always looking at ways to um, improve our teaching and to offer classes that are really relevant to you. 
Um, so we appreciate that so much. Uh, scan that link and um, it looks like we'll be finishing a little early and, and know that people never usually complain when they finish a class early. So <laughs> this is good. Um, and I wish you all a wonderful weekend ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, it was a great class. Learned a lot. Yeah, and thank you for sharing. Yeah, bye. Bye.